Good to be here. I appreciate being here. And uh, my son, my older son, Wood, Richard Hanley, is here. Uh, he's actually Mayo Malone when we're junior. We call him Wood. I'm not going to put him in the Mayo days. I was through, so we were going to go and it works out well. So he's, he's very good. He's up here playing a game on my phone. And it works out well. Uh, of course, my mom and dad are here. And Elaine is here as well. So thank you very much for coming. And I have many other relatives here as well. Um, too many to actually get name. So I won't get into that, but thanks for the comments as well. Um, so I've been asked today to talk about Coca-Cola. Uh, and I'm sure the people in here know more stories than I do about the company. Uh, there are quite a few that rose in this room as we speak. And they all know some great history of the, of the company. Uh, a little bit of insight on me. Uh, I went to Emory University in Atlanta. I only went there once spent four years there, which they're very happy about. I didn't spend any more than four. But in my third, in my, in my third year, sorry, my fourth year, my grandmother, Miss Julia, came up, and we happened to have a chance to walk through the Coca-Cola Museum. And that was when it was downtown next to the railroad depot, when they moved to the next fancy one here at Olympic Park. And I said, what a great part-time job this would be. So I was hired by Coca-Cola Company to work in the museum. Uh, I gave tours to thousands and thousands people, uh, some that you would know, some that, a lot of school groups, some very famous people, Jimmy Harvey, the one that was interesting. Uh, Ted Turner was probably the most, second most interesting person. Uh, if you ever think, I may be you, never met Ted Turner yet. He puts me out of the inside of saying, hey, Ted Turner's got a lot of energy. And then Jay Fonda, of course, as well was there. But, so, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the company itself, and I'll tie the company into Quincy and how we kind of all get connected. So, and this is going to be interactive. So, I'd like to share, so anybody might know the year that Coca-Cola was in the... 1880, the year was 1886. And anybody might want to know the person who invented Coca-Cola? The pharmacist. The pharmacist, Dr. Don Spike Pepperton. And it was basically medicinal. It was uh, something to help people get rid of headaches. Uh, so that's how it got started. And it was, a, it was not a bottle of uh, drink. Uh, it was done in soda fountains or, phar or pharmacies. That's how the soda fountain pharmacy connection came, came around. Um, so when that occurred, Dr. Pepper was not a businessman by any means. He basically was spending more money on it than he was making. So he sold it to Asa Candler a year later. Remember, that's how much he sold Asa Candler for the, company, the actual, the actual secret formula. Uh, your clothes. $2,300. That was a lot of money. So $2,300. So uh, I think the $2,300 I understand was actually to make up what he lost to basically to break even for it. So Asa Campbell took the company and really built the company as we know today. But Asa Campbell's focus, ironically enough, was on just the syrup and the soda fountains. They hadn't yet got to bottle. Uh, actually, we got a Mississippi bottle for the first time. And I took some notes here. It was the Beat Behind Company. Uh, two gentlemen, the B9 brothers, out of Mississippi, about 1994, uh, for the first time. And that was a very intriguing thing because the firm the company had never seen that they bought the syrup. You would go buy the syrup from the company and then you would put it in your soda fountain. And then, how many people already know soda fountain had Coca Cola made in soda fountain? Take three or three of my hands, except for my son. <laughs> I'm still trying to find one that actually does that. Um, so, when they bought it, they would buy it, and they started bottling it. They bottled it, it went fairly well, but it wasn't a ongoing thing. It was still a syrup company. It really was a syrup based firm until about 1914, uh, 1915. So, 1914, 1915, uh, a group of two, a couple of gentlemen brothers, and they were, uh, it was actually two guys friends, Thomas and Whitehead, out of, out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And if anybody knows Chattanooga, Tennessee, it's got a very, very big. Um, relationship with the Coca-Cola company as well, very similar to what we have when it comes down to culture, how the, the, the company and the town are very right, intermingled. So Thomas and Whitehead bought the bottling rights from the Coca-Cola company. I don't guess they paid for the bottling rights from the Coca-Cola company in 1928, 1940. You know what I guess? Right. $125,000. Oh, that was a big wish. Uh, $1. So Thomas and White had paid $1 to the Coca-Cola Company royalties to bottle the Coca-Cola. 
buy like 100 bottles. So at this point, Coca Cola was getting very popular. And the challenge we had there then was everybody was copying. Very similar to what they do today. Chinese are very bad about knocking this off. Well, people were knocking off Coca Cola down then. They were making, and you see the bottles out there. There's a great display of bottles over here in the Art Center of different types of Coca Cola bottles. There was no what we call continual looking bottle like you know today. They were straight shaped bottles and round shaped bottles and and we were bought just standard bottles and then also you saw companies making Coca Cola, Coca Cola, uh, what was this called Coke? Believe it or not, like what was it? and then with all these different names they were not bottles. They weren't the real thing, so to speak. That was not fun right way to yeah. So so what the company had to do was come up with a bottle, and again, it was developed by a group out of Tennessee, which is the contour shaped bottle, which is what we're monitoring has right here. Uh, the actual first bottle was a little different. It was actually a little bit wider in the center. Um, and they put this bottle together. And the bottle was basically very, it's the same bottle as you see today. This is an eight ounce bottle, but the old bottle was a six ounce bottle, we all know. So, one thing I forgot to mention, the script, believe it or not, was done by Dr. John Sight Pemberton's bookkeeper. His bookkeeper developed the name of Coca-Cola and how it scripted out. So that was done back in 1986 as well. I should have mentioned that earlier. So, so that's interesting. So we're now we're at the bottle. So now we have the bottle done. So one of the things you started seeing is you started seeing bottle plants popping up throughout the South at this point in time. And the one thing we're doing with the bottle plants is they put the name of the bottle, the name of the panel, the bottle of the plants. And so then you start seeing people liking the bottles from all different places around the country and around the South. So it's kind of neat. So at this point in time, AC Canada built the company up to a very large company. It was selling, it was actually, they were selling the syrup to bottlers. They were also selling the syrup still in soda fountains. Uh, and at that point, they got some, they basically got some financial issues in the early, early 20s. And the board of directors then brought a general yes. line some financial issues. Financial issues. They were just growing too fast. I'm sorry, they were growing too fast. Like I talk too fast sometimes, so I apologize. Um, so as they grew, they were facing, it's very similar to what small companies do today. They grow so fast, they don't think about the future, they're thinking about today. They're, not being, they're being reactive, not proactive. They're working, as I say, in the business, not on the business. So the board of directors brought in a gentleman by the name of Robert Woodward. Does anybody want to guess how old Robert Woodruff was when he became president of the Coca Cola Company? You're, you're in the war. 33 years old. He was there until 1984. He was president for a long, long time. And the big thing why Robert Woodruff did with the company, which is very important to understand, is when World War II broke out, at this point, Coke was still five cents, hadn't gone up at all. When World War II broke out, the first thing Robert Luther said is I want every soldier in, that's overseas to have the exact same Coca-Cola they had at their own town. So he sent ships overseas with bottle plants and built bottle plants throughout Europe. That's why Coca-Cola became so popular so quickly in Europe. After we left, we left the bottle plants there. So even though he sold bottle plants, he did create bottle plants. Correct. So what she said, even though they sold the volume rights, they created volume plants in Europe. That's correct. So what that did was that built your European base for Coca-Cola. All right? That's why Coca-Cola is so big in Europe, because of World War II. People don't realize that. Robert Woodruff realized that, yes, ma'am? Sorry, what? No, no. And you spoke to the actual pharmacies of Atlanta. Now, the Pepper family may have been from Columbus, but the pharmacies of Atlanta. It was torn down in I believe the 20s. I don't, I'm not sure I'm sorry. I'll, I'll connect, I'll connect, I'm sorry. I'll come back, I'm going to connect that in a second. That's the Quincy connection, so I'm getting there. So I'm kind of going to get the history and then I'll come back to the Quincy connection. Because I think a lot of people here know the story of the Quincy part. And I'll, if you don't, that's great. I'll get to that. Well, I'll get you the Quincy part too. So what I'm doing is like, I'm connect. What I want to do is I want to get you the company, or the company group and connect to the Quincy. So, so now, basically, that's where the European base came from. Okay, so that's how the company grew so quickly. <coughs> so, during this time, one of the things that he found out, so let's get to the Quincy part. So we're here for it. Well, I have one question. Here you go. It's a board of directors, so is this a publicly traded company? It's a publicly traded company. So, what did that happen? Well, it's a publicly traded company. So, what did that happen? Well, it's a publicly traded company. So, what did that happen? Well, it's a publicly traded company. So, what did that happen? Well, it's a publicly traded company. So, what did that happen? Well, it's a publicly traded company.
I think it was in the early 20s, I remember correctly. It was right after, after Mason came and took him, he needed more capital, and he became a public trader. I don't know the exact year. That's like people. There you go. So, thank you very much. Thank you, you know. See, I don't know. Before, before, uh, after, or before. That's right. So, so what happened was at this point in time, so here's the Lincoln at Quincy to the Columbus to Atlanta. So, as everybody knows, Joe right here, there was a banker in town in Mr. Pat. And he was, to put it mildly from my understanding, I didn't know him, other people here did, uh, was very um, spirited. Had a, a, a interesting personality. And very, uh, well, he was very opinionated about certain things. And when he thought he wanted, he thought you should do something, you should do it. Is that appropriate for school? Actually, we'll do other better than that. <laughs> So, 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 he, so he was president of Quincy State Bank for years, which was which was originally wasn't where it is now, but basically I, I like to just point to the corner because that's where the bank was for many, many years. And, um, and one of the things back then, being the first chartered bank in the state of Florida, he was very well connected to other people in the South that are bankers. And W.C. Bradley from Columbus obviously was the banking business as well, and that was their connection. And so they would talk on a regular basis through, you know, back then there was no email, obviously, so they would do a lot of letters, and they would they travel to and from, they would talk, and or meetings with banking and get business. So one of the things WC Bradley suggested is that you should look at this company called Coca Cola. And Mr. Pat bought into it, hand and fit his foot, and everything else, and believed that everybody should spend five cents to get something that tastes better than water. I'm sure back then water was probably not like it is today, not filtered, it was a little dirty. So he had something that actually was clean, that tasted good, and gave a little pop to have a little sugar. So essentially at that point in time, Mr. Pat came back. Of course, he bought it to himself, personally. But then what he did was, which is, and you guys can correct me here to know this, but I think this is pretty accurate. People would come to the bank to get what? To get loans. To plant their crops, which is a big crop area here. And so they would come to Mr. Bradley, or to Mr. Pat, and say, Mr. Pat, I need a loan for my to go out and plant my crops. He said, that's fine. But you've got to take part of that money, or part of the money you make, and buy some spoke cola stuff. And so he almost threatened. <laughs> In some sense, and say, listen, you're buying this, I'm going to give you the loan. Now, today, that would be legal. Then it wasn't. Now, something else I want to point out, too. There was a lot of, in the 20s, in the early 20s, and even up into the early 30s, what we call a lot of insider information passing along from public companies. And it wasn't illegal. So they could talk about what the, what the company was doing and what was, what, what was going on. So Mr. Bradley would share to Mr. Pat what was happening to the company. And he and Mr. Pat bought it to the phone for that reason. Do you want to say something? Uh, sorry, I heard that the company had a lot of money to drink about. He felt that that was so exciting. He was the visual to buy the stock. So that was the problem. So basically what he said, was, we, we, we couldn't hear that. That's what I was going to say. So basically what he did was he had, he was worried, Mr. Pat was worried about the unstableness of the farming at that point in time. And he would loan the money for the farm, but then also loan additional money for the Coca-Cola stock. Wow. And, well, like I said, it's, and it's a friendly way of making you about well, making you pick you up. Makes sense. I thought it was too. So, so Joe, Joe brings up a good point too, and I, that, it's interesting because I, I'm still in the banking business today. And what, and what Mr. Pat probably did as well, I thought of it as a collateral as well. So you buy the stock, I believe it at that moment it becomes collateral with the money you're getting. Because farming is going to fall off the face of the earth in about the next 15 years, it might be 30. And think about World War II bring around the Um And in fact, that when that occurred, that was used as collateral. So, a great point. So, what, so what, that, what happened is, had all these here farmers and locals in the Quincy market that had Coca Cola stock from the 1920s. I have a great grandfather that thought agriculture was going to do it, and somehow did not end up to the Coca Cola stock. And they're quite in the museum. I had many, many people that came through that from the South and said, I heard my grandfather heard about this Coca Cola stuff and never bought it. They were really just, they were very distressed.
A lot of them have scattered. I will tell you, the families that are part of Coca-Cola Heritage, this town at least, have stayed closer together than most, uh, which is very important to me as well. So, you know, that, that's really the, the heritage of Quincy in connection to W.C. Bradley, Mr. Pat Monroe, and the connection to Atlanta is the, the connection that occurred. Um, it, it's, you know, my guess is it'll still be a connection over the next 30, 40, 50 years to this town. Uh, it'll be a connection to Columbus, because I still love the people in Columbus that know the W.C. Bradley story well, and they actually know the Quincy. It's funny, the people in, in Columbus know the Quincy story well, What's he going to tell us to me well? So they know there's, there's always a special connection there. Uh, my father spent time kind of building his army base there for a period of time. He's been hitchhiked back to Quincy. So I think it was a road going up between Columbus and Quincy <laughs> for many, many different reasons. Yeah, 27 was worn out. Um, so let me see if I missed anything. I covered a lot. Yeah. Yes, Jeff. Bradley was the first chairman of the board, which Joe just mentioned. And again, I go back to the fact that this is before you, you can share information about anything at any time. It wasn't, there was no insider information. So uh, back then, of course, that changed in the 30s. On the break. You know, and, and that, that would be a big issue. I don't know the exact day when the <coughs> trading act came out. 34, 34, 39, I think it was. But, so you saw a lot of people that really did well uh, up until that point in time. Yes, Different 
How many children does Mr. Pat have? 18. I like the other guy said that. 18 children. Yes. He was one of 22. Yeah, so his, his family was actually smaller. So my point to you is the Mr. Pat family is very large. So it's pretty much any connection to Quincy with Mr. Pat is pretty well connected with Mr. Pat. It's just that we have 18 children. Now there are people overseas in the, that are connected to him. There's a big group in Atlanta. Big group of people. Yeah, that's true, not anymore. But there was a group, group in Atlanta. Uh, a group, group in Washington. Some folks in California. So they're spread out over the country. The one thing I'll tell you about Quincy, I'll, one second, I'll, a little quick story, is I, and I'm not kidding. I can pretty much go anywhere in the U.S. and somebody will know Quincy for it. It's, it's, it's the scariest, weirdest thing. And they'll know somebody from there. Because when you have 18 children in one family, there's a connection somewhere. It's, 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 there's, forget six degrees of separation, it's about two. So, just that. Now, you said Mr. Pat's last name is Woodruff? Monroe. 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 And who is Woodruff? Woodruff was a president hired by basically uh, Asa Candler and the board. Essentially, the really the board, the FSC Brown and board. Woodruff was from Atlanta, really a young businessman at that point in time, 33 years old, and took the company to where it is today. Robert Woodruff. When you see uh, on PBS that it says, and yeah, sponsored in part by the Woodruff Foundation, yes. that's that. That would be the Woodruff, yes. Oh. Especially if you're in Georgia, the Woodruff Foundation is huge. I don't know how big the Woodruff Foundation is nowadays, but it's probably massive. And that would be the Woodruff Arts Center. Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Yeah, Woodruff was, was, was the chairman and Bradley was the chairman as well? No, there weren't two chairmen. No, Woodruff was the president. The president. There was, okay. there was a chairman and the president. The chair. WC Bradley was the chairman, and Joe thinks you'll know about that. And Woodruff was hired as president to run the everyday operations of the company. And his, his big stick was, what's interesting I learned about Woodruff is that he actually, one of the first things he did is he built an international division at Coca Cola. They never done it before. And that was before the war. So when the war occurred, it was kind of very quickly. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that I've heard in the time period just happened. So this is like 1920s, late 1920s to the 30s. Woodruff was hired in, he was, he was president for 33 years from 1926, sorry, 1926 president. So I was about the same time W.C. Bradley was there. Was there as he just become a right at the same time he become chairman. Yeah. That that is where I came up with the So there was no, there was no consistent bottle. That was the whole point. That was a challenge with knockoffs and things of that sort. So there were I mean, there were there was a bottle here in Quincy <laughs> that that I think we only ever used this bottle. There was some other bottle we saw too. But uh, it, it, the, the fact is, is that the bottle rights was key. It's, it sold bottle rights to the Tennessee group to Thomas and Whitehead for God, but then they sold bottle rights to other people as well. That was just the first time they did it. So, and then the company, I don't know until the, I think 80s actually owned bottle plants all over the country and the world. And then they developed a company called Coca Cola Enterprises. Put them off, and it became an individual company that's actually not a company, literally in Atlanta. But if they own the bottlers, they own about 95 or so of the bottlers now throughout the country, the countries in the world. It's called Coca Cola Enterprises. Like how they part of Coca Cola. Yeah, it's 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 The first bottle. It's still the most uh, well-known brand throughout the, throughout the world. Yes, was that the point that she said a while ago? Something about Coca-Cola Enterprises. A Coca-Cola Enterprises has come back under the Coca-Cola company and come rolling again. Oh, okay. Uh, I have another question. Robert F. Monroe, was he a son of Monroe? Yes. 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 He's my father. That's his daughter right there. Okay. <laughs> so there's your He was the 17th of April. Sorry? He was the 17th of 18. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just 
that people. <laughs> whatever it's worth, my father's family was uh, 17 children, I think. He was the youngest of 17. I just believe, I, and I'm, obviously nobody here is 90 plus years old, but I, I truly believe you had a lot of farmers back then that needed people to help on the farms and kids, and they needed people to run those farms. And that's you also had very high rates of infant mortality. Right. Yeah. And, and if I can add this, the original tools of the kids, he was a banker, he had a brother who was a judge, and another brother who was a dentist. Two sisters who knew the presidents of Emory University, the last president of Emory in Oxford, and the first president of Emory in England. All of them were college educated. The girls went to Wesleyan and Jamaica. The boys went to Emory. Uh, but to my uh, grandfather, who was his only surviving son, started a tradition of all the roads going to Georgia Tech. Yeah, so there was a big tradition between Emory and Georgia Tech. Uh, he died and always had to hire somebody to dig a ditch. So so basically, and that's a great point. So that's a very good point. The reason the George Tech connection happened and no reminds us today is because he was dead on. They were, he was, they were really concerned that farming was going to go away and we were engineers and we needed farmers. So he said, his kids basically said, go to George Tech because you'll get a really good degree from George Tech. Um, what's interesting about Emory, I'll go back to Emory real quickly, and, and again, I'll go back to my grandmother again. So I went to Oxford Emory for the first two years. And when I went there, my grandmother said, I don't believe that person, I don't believe that, that person, I don't believe that person. Good grief. I'm like, I have no idea. And I mean, these people, and, and she goes, that's my brother in that picture. And I'm like, I have And it was just amazing. And that's the original Emory campus. It's about 25 miles east of Atlanta, between Augusta and Atlanta. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. The, the, the company, the company, well, the company probably has something to do with it. But Emory University basically has gone through now and renovated the entire campus and built new buildings and um, kept the old buildings that were built way back in the 1800s that are absolutely gorgeous. And they have all, there's Monroe's in there. And I call them the NUM Monroe's and MLM Monroe's. We're in the NUM Monroe's. What's the big difference? The real way. What are the real ways? <laughs> well, the real way is NUMRO, but when we came over from Scotland, we added the E to it. So it's NUMRO E. Um, but there are MLM Monroe's. We're not only in the MLM Monroe's. That's very important to say. But there are the roads out there. And it's, if, you, if you ever get to go to Oxford, through Oxford, Georgia, on I-20, it's not, it's a beautiful campus. Um, there's a lot of connections with the Monroe family and you know, from Cole on that campus as well. But uh, it's, it's funny. I just wanted to say, Joe, gave a very illustrious list of things. Thank you. Very good history of are the doctors and lawyers. We're basically a bunch of shopkeepers, though, originally. <laughs> I wanted to tell y'all that when he's talking about this 1930s period, my grandfather's already 70 years old, 68, 70 years old. So as we look at our own lives, as we creep towards 68 or 70 and think maybe we've seen it all or done it all, I just want to remind you that there are a lot of people who are still kicking off some pretty dang good ideas for a long time at this part of our lives, and we have a lot left to do. Here, <laughs> He has never been shy to say her opinion either, so I'll tell her a little about her. She's on the road. She's on the road. Exactly. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So are they pronounced differently? Monroe and Monroe? Who's the one part of Gaston County you're from? Who's the one part of Gaston County you're from? And if you've been in Washington, D.C. for a little while, I guess you might change that. Monroe, Well, what's interesting, I'll share another little story too, real quickly. And this is connected. So there's uh, Fowl's Castle in Scotland. Um, which is in Fowles Castle. Yes. And it's, it's the Monroe family, basically, Castle. And uh, one of the things the Monroe's did is M O U, I'm sorry, M U and R O. And um, they, about 20 years ago now, they basically renovated the entire castle. And there's a connection with that as well to Quincy. Uh, there were quite a few Monroe's that actually helped do that and get it renovated. Uh, my grandmother went over there for a couple of years. 18, 20 years, she would go over for four to five, three to four weeks on the average of choice, take grandchildren, um, spend time in the Monroe family castle. And, um, and there were quite a few other families members as well that helped out when we build that castle. So the, the actual Monroe family, 
Coca-Cola actually helped has also helped restore heritage in the Monroe uh, home in Scotland, which I think is actually what people don't know about. Um, and, and the Coca-Cola gave that opportunity for us to be able to do that, to help rebuild and, and preserve that castle. Uh, the Monroe's have been from Scotland come to Quincy. I, I can't count them because they've been here, but they've been here many, many different times. And uh, it's interesting because they always feel like our, this is part of their home as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a connection we've done with folks in Scotland. Yeah. So, so my great, so my grandmother's grandmother actually buried in Edinburgh, Scotland. So, um, so it's, it's, there's, it's interesting the, the tentacles that have happened from what happened here in the 1920s is spread out really worldwide. And I'm, very, and I'm very thankful that's been the case. Um, and I, you know, I'm very thankful that I've had the chance to spend some time with the person who was able to give so much back. And she taught me so much to be able to get, do things like this, uh, to give back to community organizations like this. Uh, I sit on the finance board here um, and help out. Quite a few other folks have a lot of, uh, get a lot out of this organization. I was very close to working with the community theater as well. I'll never forget, I'll share a quick story about the theater. This is not a plug for me, but I'll make sure that I know this is a bunch of that. So when the Lee Theater was purchased, um, it, was, it was in bad shape, and they put a roof on the first day. And, and my grandmother was so dedicated to giving back to me, she just went and bought me like, eight or nine seats in the Lee Theater. If she didn't go, she'd go pull people out of church and say, she, take my tickets and do something about it, give it to somebody. She, that's just the way she was. And, and, and I really believe that her father and his belief in it, and his, he was a, he was a very dominant person, but the fact that he didn't care. He did love his children very much, and he wanted his children to have a great education. And the Coca-Cola company gave him the opportunity to do that, and then gave his children's children, and then his children's children's children the same opportunity. I really think I drove from him believing in education and driving that education down to from 18 to, I don't know, how many, how many what's the descendant line down there? I have no idea. I can't remember. Between Joe and I, I don't know how many There's hundreds. Hundreds and hundreds of rows that have descended from Mr. Pat that are still getting the uh, effects of his decisions back in the, you know, the early on in the 1900s. And, uh, Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question was, and there's no such thing as an outsider in Quincy, everybody's family, so your family. No, no, not anymore. That's one thing about Quincy I'm very proud to say. But nobody here is from the outside, everybody's from our family. Right. So the question was, what will the income be so if you bought one share in 1919, oh now, well it depends on how many shares they have. So so it's a dip. Yeah, it dip. It's oh yeah, it's too much. Not much. A billionaire is gonna get like twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars. You're not gonna live off of it. No. But what you're gonna, what you're essentially gonna live off is the fact that you probably have stock for a long time and you be able to get back. There's that's the big thing. Um, and, and I will tell you this: I gave up trying to figure out the cost basis about 20 years ago. So I just count, my cost basis is the penny. That's the best way to look at it. Um, and uh, so most people still have code from the original back from from their parents or grandparents. It's usually about a penny. If you want back to Mr. Pat, it's probably about a penny or a penny. <laughs> so. Yes, right. Yes. So uh, early on, when Mr. Patton was making these people borrow a lot more money than they wanted to buy stock that they may not have wanted anyway, was he uh, vilified in the community until the stock was dropped? Never. He was giving them a loan in the depression and had a bank that didn't fail. Yeah. So one of the things he did was, they could probably tell the story better than I. Uh, so, when the Great Depression hit, 
and they, but basically told them to shut down all the banks. Yes. He stuck their nose up in the air. He stuck his nose up and said, I ain't shutting down. I'll shut down my bank, but I'm going to pull every dollar, every cent, every gold bar, every silver coin, everything I've got, and put it in the front door and lay it down the front door and let people see it when they walk by the front door. That's just his attitude. He never closed. He never closed. He didn't want to FDIC, did he? He didn't just really got right here. He That's just his attitude. He yeah. felt that he felt that if he kept his bank solvent and kept his bank financially responsible, why in the world should he buy the FDIC with a bunch of people that can fail in banks? But he could he could take care of his customers and his community. And that was his attitude. So uh, I think I've got the time I'm getting done. Uh, <laughs> Shoot for more questions. I'm just curious, you know, the way it happened here, you know, with are there any other towns or stories that are down for similar prices that they have with that? Columbus. Columbus. Okay. But it was one that you guys could have taken a lot of money in Columbus. In Atlanta, and obviously. There's a lot of there's a lot of money in Atlanta in the same similar stories. In Chattanooga, there's a lot of But what you kind of Areas that like Chattanooga and Somalia. Uh, uh, I've never heard, I worked in the museum for five years, but I never heard any type of lies except for like this one here. Uh, and, I, and people really covered well. You know, I, I also belong in the United States. Uh, but, but typically it was the areas like Chattanooga. Mississippi has a nice little lines because of the folks uh, of Mississippi and actually Columbus, Quincy. Um, that, that was really the end, of course. Anybody else here? One thing that my father reminded me about was back in the 60s, uh, and actually probably the 50s too, there were so many shareholders in Quincy, they would actually send a courier down from Atlanta to pick up all the proxies. I heard Quincy and pick up all the In the 60s, what happened was the proxies. So in the 1960s, there were so many shareholders, so, there were so many shareholders in Quincy, they had more millionaires per capita than any other city in the United States here. And it was also, Quincy at one point, I think this is not this is not factual, but this is probably pretty accurate, that there were ten percent of all the shares held by the company were held here in Quincy in the sixties. Which is a lot. And that's because people didn't sell it, they sell it. And that's why you can be a biker in Seattle, Washington to sort of notice the story. So Bobby, my Bobby, Joe, and myself are happy to be around, or my father will be around. If you guys have any more questions, I can tell you these two, these three folks know probably more than I do. Uh, I can tell you a lot about the history of the company and a lot about because I work there and, and the stories I've told. But these, these, he's written a great book on the history of the county. And so he probably knows he, a lot of what you see in the book is from Sam here, I believe, in the gift shop. Phenomenal book. If you haven't looked at it, please do. And of course, my father. And, uh, you know. That's what I was saying. And you were just a kid. Yeah, I was 70. So. If you want to know about Mr. Pack, that's my father. He'll tell you all about it. So, what thank you very much. Stuff got it. It was called by some notes or something. It's in the early 80s. I think 84, 85. Sweet State Bank, I think, was probably 84, 85. That was when that happened. And the people. Was So the question was, which state bank was a private bank until 1984, 85, 83, 84, and Sonovus, which is from Columbus, got bought it. Uh, and then now it's, of course, on the Capital City Bank Group, but they still, it's still considered a state bank community here locally. But that's, it's right there in the corner, of course, it moved, but that's where it was for many, many years. So I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.